Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. So we're casting around for a topic for this episode. We're between issues of the magazine. Did we want to uh, cover another film, a piece of kit? And Mary suggested that we try and discuss simulating the ancient battlefield in um, war games or computer games or reenactments. And it's a, it, it, it potentially is a great topic, though, as Jasper has pointed out, um, we might go everywhere and nowhere. So this episode will either be classic or, or forgettable. <laughs> so joining me tonight is uh, Jasper Otage, Mary Dam, Lindsay Powell, Mark McCaffrey and Mark DeSantis. When I put this question to Facebook and our Patreon followers, uh, most came back with questions around gaming uh, and especially the Total War computer games. Um, and I, but I, I wonder if we should start with, uh, does ancient warfare conform to regular patterns that can be simulated? So Mary, it's, uh, it's your topic. You suggested it. Do you want to kick us off? The old fashioned view of uh, ancient warfare, whereby you have regular ranks of known numbers of soldiers in formations who move around a battlefield uniformly and predictably, allows a certain amount of simulation. Certainly, before battle is joined, you can put soldiers on a battletop or you know uh, pieces on a board, and it can look like a battle did before battle was joined. And then, if you know if you know the way that uh, ancient formations f moved around battlefields, there's everything going for it that you could reenact a battle on a tabletop or in any other way. The problem with any rules system, of course, is all of those vagaries of warfare, like morale and other, any other aspect of friction. Um, how do you incorporate those into any rule system that tries to simulate warfare? as opposed to using real human beings um, with all of their vagaries and all of their unpredictable behaviours into, a, into a, a simulation. But what you're doing, the key word I think is simulation. So you're not necessarily trying to do something absolutely accurately that would, in a sense, you know, someone looking at a game of cricket with all the records that you keep, you could almost recreate the game pretty accurately. We're, I'm running simulations with my job right now. Well, what we're trying to do is model likely outcomes given a certain set of conditions. So applying what you've just said where you have rules-based and you have sort of preset deployments, you could run the simulation and say you would be more likely to get this output, this end result, because of the weightings you give to cavalry or infantry or whatever it is you give. Um, and that could be helpful because that would help you to explain and understand why the battle did come out that way, even though the other side had maybe twice as many troops or something. How do you uh, measure the accuracy of any simulation other than, because we know, you know, as, as we say so often, comparatively little about how battles in ancient warfare really, you know, really went from step to step to step. I mean, it, it's like, to, to, to use um, Lindsay's analogy with cricket records, uh, you know, if, if one game is maybe, I don't know, several pages of cricket records, then our, our average ancient battle has at least several pages missing. Uh, but maybe we have the, 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 we have the first page and the last page. Yeah, it's it's like you know. How do you judge the, the simulation is correct? Do you you know? Do you get to a simulation? You go okay. You put in, you know, you put in the composition. That you may or may not know of Hannibal's army at Cannae, of um, the Roman army at Cannae, of the terrain and deployment. And is your simulation good if you get the result that is historical? Well, I think I think that's the interesting thing with historical gaming is that if you're simulating, then you should get the result that historically was gotten. But as a game where people play the game, if you know ahead of time what the outcome is going to be because your simulation is so good, why why play the game? And so I think the other aspect of it, the other aspect of, of the of the hobby is these are generally speaking grown men and women rolling dice for fun. Who want to disguise the fact that they're rolling dice for fun so all of the other 
all of the other aspect all of the other aspect of it is all fluff to disguise the fact that I'm holding a, a handful of d6s and rolling them because again that comes down to percentages and statistics yeah and, and whether you do this on a table or or in a computer game so 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 I have I have this book here the the, the lost battles by Philip Sabin Yes, that, that we just saw, but our, our listeners actually cannot see the cover. Okay, so I, I will, I will put that up there. So lost battles, um, and 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 this is very good. And I just want to read the last, just read the last uh, couple of lines here. You were talking about. So what's the point of it all? It should thus advance our understanding considerably more than would the expression of yet another set of individualistic personal hunches about the engagements concerned. So I think what he's saying is, and we see this when we comment about things on on Facebook. People have any number of ideas and hunches and perspectives and whatever, and most of which are not grounded in any sense of factual uh, basis. Um, and, and I think that the simulation compels you to be more rigorous in your thinking. Um, and, and when you've done that, you, you, you can be more accurate. And then you get more understanding from the, from the result. That's the why are you gaming, though? Because if you're gaming to get a greater understanding of what actually happened, then it, it moves far more to a simulation. But if you're gaming for the entertainment value of I love ancient warfare and I love, you know, playing with my toy soldiers on the tabletop and it can be any combination of the two. But then I don't mind putting a tank in the middle and seeing how my Roman legion would fare against a king tiger. Um, you know, they're, they're, you're, 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 you're at two extremes outside of the, the screen um, uh, of the of the game. Um, and I think, you know, there are there are there are every nuance in between there are people who get very upset with you when you've painted your soldiers in the wrong color um you know if you've got the facings wrong on a particular color or if you've you know you've you've gone down a particular way with the the uh, decorations on the shields of your spartans or whatever um and there are others that that doesn't matter um and all the way back to well actually i'm going to use pebbles uh, or smarties that was a very kiwi thing pebbles they're a kiwi thing um they're smarties by the way um you know i'm going to use smarties as my as my legions and as i take casualties i'm going to eat the smarties so, so for, for can, american can, viewers does that mean m m's by any chance uh, america has smarties doesn't it mark no nope, m m's smarties i i don't know anything about uh smarties i've heard of m m's i've heard of Reese's Pete. okay well yeah no m m's or skittles skittles M and M's or Skittles. So, so, so to to try and catch some things, some great ideas as you just said there, Murray. What, what what I'm hearing you basically say is that there, there there are there's this continuum, and in a sense, at the one end you've got simulation, which is uh, an attempt to be kind of scientific to understand and explain an historical event. Maybe fill in some of the gaps. You said you have a results table, and what you want to try and do is understand, well, how did they end up there when you might infer some other result? And at the end of the other end of the continuum, we've got gaming, which is for fun. So there, the objective is just to, as you say, show off your tin soldiers or to, you know, whatever, and maybe even try to end history and, uh, you know, so that Alexander loses, the, you know, the, the battle and the Persians win, or wouldn't that be fun? Um, it's, so it's, and maybe in between those two, they, they, there are lots of very interesting possibilities. You're right, Lindsay. It, it, simulation and games are two different things because a game would indicate some form of balance because if you're playing somebody else, you need to have a chance, you know, chess you start out with a balanced side and even if you're playing a, a misbalanced game often there will be something to slew the game for the people uh who who, who is miss miss you know who are, 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 are seen as being the weaker side to make it fun for both parties so then it's a game is not necessarily quite a simulation over the years when we've done it um you know it, it's always been you know actually this week we are going to really you know throw it to one side we're going to limit how many you know mercenaries you can add to add to an army we're going to limit the number of you know cavalry or say that this game's going to be a particular you know you can play around with things in that way and actually start to experiment and say right what is the okay maybe it's not going to be necessarily you know a historical experiment but, you know, it, you start to play around with ideas of, well, if one of these armies would have had a slightly different composition, what sort of effect that would have had. I'm just thinking, for example, that if you look at the, some of the oldest board games that we know about, for example, chess being a case of mine, that is actually a battle complete with, you know, castlements and kings and knights and all the other ways. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's masquerading as a, as a, as a war game. 
um, and, I, and I would imagine that evolved out of moving counters and so on. But what, what, what somebody must have come up with is an idea that we can reproduce a struggle between two opposing sides. We have to oppo impose a, a set of rules so that we have that balance, which is what you say there, uh, Angus, about you know, the balance in the game, everybody has a go. And it's slightly artificial because I move a piece, then you move a piece. And actually in real warfare, you know, whoever has the advantage will press that advantage continuously. They don't stop and wait for the other side to respond. So I, I would imagine in a sense that the board games that we have from the ancient world were attempts to try and put everything that would be in a real battle in, in a situation where two friends can recreate it. Mm. I wonder, does anyone ever play chess by saying, right, now you're losing two pawns in a castle before we start? You're playing, you're losing, you're losing, a, you're losing both. You've got no bishops. Sorry, you've got no knights. No, that's, that's, that's true, Murray, but... But chess books or chess, you know, uh, the chess section in, in fancy newspapers, the few that still have them, will have chess problems, which are essentially uh, are essentially that. You just say, OK, this is your situation. Think your way out of it. Yeah. I was wondering whether, you know, in terms of the, the quality of your general. So, for instance, if you're Hannibal on the chessboard, you get very few pieces. <laughs> and if your opponent <laughs> is and if your opponent is Paulus, that's like, yeah, you get the full set. But, um, yeah, I'm coming at you. You could do that, you know, especially if you've got master chess players versus uh, less competent chess players. You could absolutely rank them in terms of, yeah, you get a queen and two pawns. You should be able to win. <laughs> How do you handle anyway. gaming ancient battle scenarios in which the actual historical outcome turned on some sort of mistake made by one side, which we know about and we will do our very best mm. to avoid. Perhaps if you're gaming Kenai and you're the Roman player, you may refrain from pushing ahead very aggressively and uh, be a bit more cautious. Uh, how, how does that act as a simulation of the battle? It's a, that's a very different battle mm. of Kenai than the one that actually occurred. Well, I think that you, you kind of answered your own question there. You, you, you line up the sides as it was and, and then you refused <laughs> to be drawn in kind of thing. The, in the interesting thing about that, of course, is that, that that's the, the game as simulation, as in would I have won this battle if I had been fighting it? And, of course, you've got hindsight going, oh, well, I won't do what the person who lost the battle did. Um, but then again, it comes down to is the, was the battle of can I lost or was the battle of can I won? You're assuming as well that you're actually starting from the very beginning of um, operations. You know, you can run a game from, you know, set up at any particular stage of the campaign and say, right, from this point, um, is, there, is it possible to win? A lot of systems that want to uh, put that as they start it, like Axis and Allies, for instance, starts the war not in 1939, but in 1942, so that you actually, you can't avoid all of those things that have happened to that point. Um, and you'll also get several games that have a deus ex machina construct that at, at a point when the disastrous thing happened, like a thunderstorm, that will happen in the, sim in the game simulation so that it, it mirrors what happened, especially ge ge geographically and, and um, temporally and, you know, all of that sort you, of thing. You can't avoid the affected player, you know, being aware of that. Unless, well, but but then again, there's some games that have, uh, you know, that have a referee of some kind. You have a third person who's there to run the game who may, you know, may have said, okay, here, you know, here's your army, here's your army, here's the situation. And if you do that cleverly, then perhaps, you know, unless you have some players who are very well aware of historical battles, if you're playing a historical battle, you know, they might not recognize the situation and will recognize, you know, be aware of something coming until it, it's too late. I think the other thing which is probably the most simple way that games try and control that is, of course, the turn. You know, you've got six turns to have the bridge. So therefore, not not attacking the bridge isn't an option. Um, so... Apart from you don't really get that on the, necessarily the computer, you know, where it's continual action, it is... It's not so much I go, I go, you go, um, to keep it running. Which we, 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 Paul, Paul uh, uh, Bardunius sent us via via the miracle of Facebook. You know, he suggests that, uh, and I, uh, forgive me, Paul, if I've, I've got the wrong end of the stick here, but you know, the, the, the 
computer models uh, are, are for simulations are great because they can show you large numbers of individuals. You know, you can run an algorithm to show you what might happen with great numbers of people. But what that, the downside of that is, he suggested, whilst that might show you how a large number might react with some form of reality, what it doesn't show, it accurately portrays the, the, the smaller part, the, the real interaction uh, between soldiers and their environments, you know, the slip of the ankle, the randomness of the shield, slipping just as they as they strike. But but perhaps the reenactor uh, can simulate that part of the battle more accurately on that more individual level. Which is and uh, uh, again from Facebook. Sorry, I'll, I'll get to you in a minute, Lindsay. Rudolph points out on Facebook. You know, a lot of the computer games are very much from that top down approach where you're seeing big blocks of men moving on and not necessarily right in with that nitty gritty which perhaps the the reenactor can um can 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 simulate go on lindsay no you you took the words right out of my mouth and i think it comes back to what is the objective that you're trying to achieve as a gamer i would have to imagine it's entertainment as a simulator it's it's insight and educational uh, knowledge that you may not have gotten again sabin makes the point is that you can actually he actually actually does have uh, a simulation of can I to, to Mark's point uh, and he makes the point in there that in fact by running this model that he's got it's a dynamic model you get insights that you would not have had from traditional historical analysis so so that's worth doing uh, I think where the, where the reenactor comes in they show the limitations if you like of arms and equipment um, and, and you know we, we still wrestle with things and we've discussed them in other podcasts uh, precisely how you do a certain formation and, and all the rest. I don't need to go to that right now. Um, but I think if, if you do all of those different things as an ancient war fan historian, whatever we'd like to call ourselves as a community, you will get all of those insights and in the mind you, you get a better understanding of ancient warfare. I, I don't think one medium gives you all of the things you look for unless you're actually in the battle itself. And we can't obviously do that. So, so from reenactment and from gaming and modeling and simulations and all these different things and reading the ancient sources, um, you, you get a unique blend. I mean, I, I think Paul Berdunius, if he were here, he would point out that one of the things that, you know, he studies behavior of um, very tiny creatures in big groups and it enlarges that to how humans behave in, in massive groups. And once, you know, we're probably all not very mathematically inclined, but once you are, um, once you get that way, um, you know, you have information about how stuff moves in a group. You can usually, you seem to be able to catch that in a formula and then you can throw it in a computer and you'll, you know, go from there. So taking that idea, I, I think what that might highlight is that a genius military commander like an Alexander the Great, like a Caesar, like a Pompey, for example, uh, maybe they have at a subliminal level an understanding of that. It, it is a, to, to some degree a, a statistics game that you're playing and you're trying to match strengths with weaknesses and applying pressures here and removing things there. It's, it is a dynamic model. So, so those actually would, would maybe give you some nice insight into the eye of the commander. Well, we, we had someone points that out, uh, 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 Chairman, one of our patrons. Thank you. If anyone wants to uh, tip us a dollar, Patreon, uh, uh, patreon.com slash ancient warfare uh, podcast. Ancient warfare, add podcast at the end, not just ancient warfare. Um, suggest that, you know, it, it's statistical analysis for uh, win and loss ratios, uh, if you could sort of feed that into the machine kind of thing, that might, Again, add some realism, which, but that strangely comes back to what you were saying, Lindsay. Again, that if a commander might inherently know that on the field, that if he has, if he's outnumbered by this much, he might still have a chance, depending on the troop types that he has, uh, which which might be able to simulate. Presumably, a good commander would sort of before he engages in a battle. You know, we we have plenty of examples that you know one side in the battle offers battle, and the other commander says no, not now. And presumably that is because he makes some sort of mental calculus and says, the weather's not right, the, you know, my troops are not in the right state of mind, um, he's got so many guys, I'm expecting this many guys to come and join me, that might just be enough. You know, there, there, there's got to be not just a gut feeling going, 
at him and we'll win. Hard to hard to simulate like Alexander the Great never lost a battle. It's like, well, therefore, any situation you put me in simulation wise, I will win because I am Alexander the Great. <laughs> and I never lost a battle. Um, so it's it's a very but again, you know, the especially in terms of the numbers uh, of ancient battles, when you look at all of the you know veterans morale even even weapon types you know there are no there are no point of view shooters of the ancient world uh, there are there are point of view fantasy uh, shooters uh, uh, actually and I'm not, th- am I, think I wrong somebody yeah, I think somebody interesting hasn't made one there have been there have, there have been mods I think of I, no, I'm trying to think which one that was and there's there's been an, an RPG type game there are people who go around some of these uh, doom and things who only use their their dagger who you know never use any other weapon uh, but <laughs> which I suppose you could t- like several years ago there, there was a, a, a game that was sort of an, an ancient RPG but it was supposed to be really historical that you you know you could go and and you could chop a tree and then you could and you could was that the you know, st- that wasn't the Stone Age one was it it was a Stone Age. No, one like it, it was it, it was it was an indie thing, and uh, it was an early example, I think, of in-game purchases. And I I don't know I don't know if it still exists, um, but you could get to you know having raids with people with with your friends with the swords they made and and go chop each other up. But but I wonder, for example. Um, it, Modern officers, commanders of all different grades go through military academies and they're, and they're taught doctrines, aren't they? They're, they're taught um, that in this battle scenario, you can apply these rules and you'll improve your, um, your chance of success given this set of threats. Um, and, and obviously, what we seem to understand is that the equivalent of that didn't exist in certainly ancient Rome, and I gather probably most other ancient societies too. So what you had to do in, in, in the scenario when you were planning for battle, you'd be presumably in the commander's tent, with some kind of maps on the table. I mean, this is assuming that that's what they did. And you would pick the brains of all the other people. Your, your conchilium of, of, of advisors would say, well, my assess... And you try and assemble all of this information, this G2, that would give you the insights, and then you would then do the gaming theory in your head. If I do this, then this, and people would argue it out. So, so in other words, you'd be playing this very large ancient game of chess um, in anticipation, and then when it actually happens... You then have to hope that people are going to carry out the parts of the plan that you have negotiated ahead of time, and that's why you need to have centurions doing their thing, and whoever is in charge of the phalanx you know, will do what they're told. Because if they don't do that, the game plan goes to pieces. Um, but that, that's what I'm thinking. But in terms of your training scenario, I mean, isn't that what you have with you when you've got uh, Pompey Strabo, and supposedly in his camp at one stage you've got you know the likes of his son you've got the likes of Catiline you've got the likes of Crassus all there at the start of their career sort of um, you know basically apprenticing off him and you know taking that style forward into the the wars to come uh, same and the same with Alexander in terms of growing up um, you know with that that the idea of the companions uh, growing up with him and all being schooled in the same you know, of the tactics of Philip. And I think, for example, and one of the issues we're working on right now about Augustus at war, um, I I think that that the rotation of tribunes annually is is to create a bench of talent that at least has a modicum of insight into the way that the military works as an organisation, and then if it is deployed, how it actually works, and you can then listen to the, you know, all the ranks of centurions and the, you know, the prefects of Castorum, whatever, and then as you work through the career, at least you've got a, a baseline that you can actually refer back to. Um, so, so that, I suppose, is the ancient academy, as it will. It's a, it's um, an internship. It's it's not a formal schooling, and there's no workbook. Uh, but but there are brains to pick over, and it's very interesting. I, I remember reading, I think, in Caesar's. Gallic, well, he wasn't terribly impressed by the standard of some of the tribunes coming through his ranks um, because these guys thought it was a soft touch assignment they just have to hang around a while and you know impress the guy and off they go again so that's really why Rome had to be at war all the time they had to keep training those guys they had to train those guys they didn't have they they didn't have good simulations or board games to keep them uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, up to speed and there are ancient training manuals though, aren't there that, that sort of have been Passed down. This is Murray's thing. Yeah, well, I was, going, I was, this I was thinking about. You know, and if you're going, if you're going to fight a battle, uh, you know, the, the ancient, the manual, whoever's written it, is running through simulations in their head as they're running it, 
saying, well, if I to win this, to win a battle, you need to have your men in this type of unit. And we've taken those manuals and copied what they've written to create our modern day simulations, which those guys must have been had in their heads. They don't speak in that kind of language. Um, so the two, the two types of, uh, the, well, th the three types, there are, there's a couple that are psychological. The best type of general does this. They are as good as their men at their drill. They do this, they do this, they honor the gods. You know, so you've got Xenophon's cavalry commander and Honor Sanders the general, which are generally dismissed as, yes, of course, all that's common sense. And yet most military disasters in history can be avoided by following common sense. And bizarrely, so many of them where the commanders don't follow common sense. So that's quite useful. The second one is uh, sets of stratagems only. They don't give you any analysis of, of the stratagem. They simply list the stratagem. In this situation, this general did this. In this situation, this general did this. There's no further comment of, if therefore you find yourself in this kind of terrain, do as this general did. They don't do that, but that's the implication, we assume, of reading all of those anecdotes. And then the third style is the, this is how the formation was drawn up. This is how Alexander drew up his phalanx, but not to the point of when facing these kinds of enemies, you should do this. Just, this is the counter marches, this is the phalanx, this is how they change into this formation, this is how they change into that formation. Um, and the same with the, the De Re Militari of Vegetius that you've got, this is a legion, this is how it breaks down, this is how you do it, this is how you do it. And so, the the practical application of those formations isn't in any of the manuals. Um, and in the anecdotes, they don't generally talk formation. They just talk outcome, general, you know, he saw this, therefore he did this. He did this, he did this. So it's a very, uh, the application of that knowledge into a wider context really would only come through, through uh, practice and actually having to do it. Do you know, I, I think that what that encapsulates is, is, is the ancient mindset. Um, in the same way, for example, that uh, a lot of the books in architecture tend to be sort of snapshots of, well, you know, ratios of this, but not applying the insight. Um, so the man who, who writes the book, I forget, who, who's the man who wrote the book about uh, uh, clever machines, you know, uh, the Vitruvius, you mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're presented as toys, but not extrapolated. And you know, there are 55 applications for this. And, and I think this is partly down to just the way the ancient mindset worked. Um, and you don't see the sort of thing that uh, Angus was describing, which I'm thinking is more von Clausewitz type thing, until what, the 1500s or something, where people are actually you know, drawing these things out, probably inspired by the ancient writers, but they really are trying to understand. They do the same thing in terms of architecture as well. Vitruvius comes up with the, the perfect idea of how you should lay out a town, and yet it's never followed. So, you know, you should cite it, you know, in this direction, you should place it, it should be laid out in a grid format, but, you know. So what it, what it highlights, in a sense, in a sense, these were intellectual pursuits and playthings. You know, you, you've got seven hours in your day, so let's amuse ourselves and imagine what a, a city might look like. And, and I have to imagine when it comes to generalship and command, um, you know, that the people would be reading, presumably, quite extensively. And it would be in the discussion of those ideas around the dinner party in the camp tents and so on that maybe they would have arrived at those insights, but they didn't write them well, down. Well, Marius, of course, abuses anyone who believes that they can become a general by reading a book. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that those books aren't written. There's lots of them that don't exist and don't survive. Um, and we know Pompey read, uh, you know, we know Pompey read works on strategy. They aren't specified which, unfortunately. Um, and Alexander kept Homer as a, as a, you know, under his pillow to read for insights into being a general in warfare. Um, but I think the other thing is that the... Um, uh, it's worth mentioning that Pompey and Alexander seem to have a very different style of being a general. Mm, absolutely. And I, I think certainly when you, you know, re you read the anecdotes. So uh, Frontinus's collection has 484 stratagems and Polyinus has 900 and... Well, he says 900 and then 800 and... 80 something survive so there, there, there's huge numbers of you could pretty much get away with anything you like and there are even stratagems which contradict one another because the opposite works in a different situation with a different set of parameters um, firstly I think the readership of these isn't 
low level, it's high level, and it's like, well, have you read? Um, whereas the people who are enacting military tactics are centurions and lower ranks. So therefore, the know-how of how ancient battle works is a generational, you know, 25 year, 16 year veterans who know what to do and how to do it. Um, very much the face of battle kind of approach, but no one's written their perspective, um, which is which is always a, a sort of a tricky um, fact of the ancient warfare that we, we've actually got the aristocratic and upper echelons point of view. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the these handbooks most of the ones that survive are abused as being mere literary exercises rather than practical. But there is a practical kernel to them. Um, and then in the 16th century, when you've got the, the Dutch masters and then um, others reading Elian's tactics, which was always abused, suddenly they go, I know how to mount, make a counter march for, for musketeers because I've read a Greek you know, manual, or this is what we should do with our pike and musketeer phalanxes. We should model them on the ancients and then adopt changes based on experience. So those are, you know, amazing insights that you get from ancient manuals in the, the Renaissance and early modern period. So they do what we're talking about. Right. And I think that's the difference. You see, that's the Enlightenment age, right? That's where people dig into the past and they say, how do we make it work for our own day? How do we make our world better from the insights of the ancients? Um, and of course, you know, you project that through to our world where we're very, you know, rigorously scientific to the point of the you know, nth degree. So sometimes we become so specialized, we can't actually apply any doctrines anymore because, you know, you've got to be a programmer, you've got to be a this, you've got to be that. Um, so, so there's an argument for taking a couple of steps back. But um, it, it just is fascinating that war, in a sense, command was in those days uh, the space which the higher class occupied. Um, it was, in a sense, it was class warfare, and I don't mean it in the modern sense, but you know what I mean. It's because the, the, the people in the, in the higher echelons were the ones directing the troops on the battlefield. It wasn't usually their way around. But that, but that's only dropped out in the last century. You know, right up until the World Wars, you had uh, officers were aristocrats. Um, well, especially um, in England. Oh, the Prussian, the Prussian, the Prussian military arist aristocracy. Yeah, that's true. They just seem to have had more. As well. mm. 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 I would kind of expect those Prussians to be more educated than the stereotypical <laughs> English. So anyway, before you, sl you know, slag off the whole country. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was going to say arist aristocrats, you know. So, so, so one, David suggested on Facebook, um, uh, and I can't remember where, where we were slightly leaving it. We, we, were, we were talking about uh, manuals, uh, and he suggested if you're going to simulate war, is it easier to do so when you're looking at the, the these more uh, professional, semi-professional, regular troops that that fight in formations than necessarily the more um, individual actions of the uh, you know, I want to say rabbles, but you know what I mean. You know the the, the, the people that we don't necessarily think fought in rank and file. You know, is there a problem with simulation? There? I, I think so because what you're doing is you're 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 understanding a set of rules that those people are trained in, and at the macro level you can say, well, since Romans fighting cohorts and cohorts work it this way and this formation, you know, you can start deriving a number of predictable truths if you like, but but beyond that it gets hard. There's a lot of assumptions in how a Roman cohort fought and in how a Roman centuria fought. Um, and on the other, you, you might think that, you know, mob behavior, coming back to Paul Bardunius, we know how a mob works. Uh, and, and, and you can observe, uh, you know, small mobs that fight with sticks by, you know, anthropologists have been doing that for, for quite a while. I think the other thing, of course, is that you get, you get the opposite effect in the way that some people will interpret ancient warfare in modern terms. They will look at a phalanx in terms of momentum, um, and you know the refused phalanx, the refused flank of uh, of Leuctra is not looked at as a a tactic of keeping unreliable troops out of battle, but it's looked at as a as a as a more um, 
sort of esoteric, that's a way of stopping the enemy advancing towards you because they would lose cohesion. And all of those sorts of terminologies are applicable in some ways. But I think in terms of no Greek general thought about momentum for their phalanx, they thought about depth and they thought about, you know, and then the morale and um, all of that sort of momentum, momentum in terms of different like the momentum of battle as opposed to the momentum of the force of troops you've got running towards you. Um, and same at the Battle of Marathon, for instance, uh, that you look at the, you know, the decision to run, which we explain by saying, well, that's because there was 200 yards where they were within uh, archery range and therefore they ran under that as a way of nullifying the, the most strong attack of the Persians and then one-on-one, of course, they're going to defeat the Persian formations with their wicker shields. Um, but then it's like we don't get that explanation. You know, Miltiades, Callimachus, we don't get, oh, we're running because we need to get under their archery. There's no, there's no, that explanation is not made. And similarly with Caesar, you don't get, I'm out flank, I'm out uh, matched in cavalry at um, the Battle of Pharsalus. Therefore, I'm going to put infantry in my cavalry to match the numbers of Pompey's cavalry. You don't get that explanation even from Caesar. You get a you get a much more um, vague kind of you know. And then you know, oh, it's a combination of arms. You don't get that explanation. I'm combining infantry with cavalry for this purpose. You don't get that. Um, it's almost accidental. And then we go along and go, no, no, they're all hemipoi. No, no, they're all that. No, they're all doing that. They're all doing that. Which... But essentially, the one, the one thing I don't think we have, and this would be helpful, in the sense that today, modern armies and commanders review missions and conflicts with after-action reports. And you could argue that the Gallic War, for example, is, is a kind of after-action report, but with a political intention. But well, what's interesting, but nowadays... They all, they all, don't they all have political purposes? You know, even well, today? But, but I was going to say, um, you, you could argue, because ultimately you could... Uh, yeah. Like when but, but Churchill's say, what, Second World War is an after-action report on himself. <laughs> yeah, but what I was going to say is that nowadays, I mean, we, we can pour through reports, or we can pour through academic books where you've got very precise depictions of battles with symbols and you know uh, topologies of the, of the battle sites and so on and nothing like that survives from the ancient world so I'm just wondering we tend to analyze the battles for insights and learnings and I, and I don't know whether that was necessarily what Caesar would do uh, maybe doing him down but but we haven't got the, the diagram with little flags on saying I was here I was there <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone recommend a set of war games rules that would best simulate uh, ancient battles? Uh, and uh, could you also recommend one that would be especially playable? Are those two things <laughs> compatible? Well, uh, yeah. The, well, yeah, there's a, there's well, now a we had a question about the, the, what, where, where, where do you strike the balance between uh, accuracy and gameplay to uh, you know to allow for mass 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 appeal well, beyond that would military be a very history personal fetishists, choice, wouldn't it? Is the cop out answer? I have the answer. Firstly, you're you writing it, the, aren't you? you? You find the group. No, no. You find the group of of people you're going to play with. You put them into psychoanalysis for an extended period of time to discover what what play style that group of people actually enjoys. And if someone is found to be incompatible with your play style, they are ejected. And they are replaced by someone with another compatible playstyle, and not 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 rejected as in gone. They're just put into another group whereby they are with other people who like the playstyle that those people like. And then you find the rule set that is either more gamey, more rules lawyery, uh, more wh- whichever where it, wherever it falls in the crunch fluff uh, spectrum. Uh, and the then actually, spectrum. I like. Do you like that? Do you like that? Thank you. Thank you. The crunch, the crunch fluff spectrum. That's a. Oh yeah, yeah. And then I think the point then is it doesn't matter if you have a rule system that matches your punch, your crunch fluff spectrum rating rating for your group. Actually, you're all going to have a good time gaming in that particular rule set, which is what people try and do with a much less scientific way because they all say, "Let's try this game system." Oh, I love it. It's my favorite. Oh, no, I don't like it very much. I prefer that game system. Oh, I don't like that game system. That game system's too crunchy. You're like, aha, we could fix all this by simulating what kind of people we're gaming with before we start. Oh, like, I'm, I'm, where's my microphone? I need to drop it. Well, 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 (laughs) Mark, uh, I can tell you, David Ranke said, what do we think of Commander Colors? And Commander Colors does recreate 
in some form of recreation the, the ancient warfare in a great way it's good fun and it's relatively fast and the whole point is you play it once and turn it around and play it from the other side has anyone played it yeah i got it i you know the, the, i think the the genius thing in command and colors is how it by using cards that tell you what that, that i mean that that's the essential mechanic i think the the battlefield is divided into a left center and right and your cards, you everybody's got five cards, I think, or six, and you you know you draw new ones to to refresh them constantly, and they tell you what you can do. You can you can move four units in your left flank, or you can move three units of this type anywhere, or you can move um, a number of units in your center and right. And it, I, I guess that's sort of it, it appeals in a way that it. It makes it into an interesting puzzle. You have to figure out what cards to use, what's best, and it makes it it, it appeals because it's an interesting way of limiting the you know the helicopter view that you as a general have. Um, that you could say, I need somebody to move over there. Well, you know, tough luck. It's you're not going to be able to do that because your communications with that flank have broken down or, or whatever. I mean. The, the the gaming of limitations is always interesting. You know the the command limitations or the 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 that that eye of God command, which you get in a lot of strategy games because you can tell anyone to do anything at any point in time, and they always hear you. Uh, is one of the things that several games are trying to do now. That is, and it's also replayability as opposed to a simulation where it's like we know the outcome, therefore the outcome will be the same every time we we run this simulation, um, and then you're starting to put in variables to see if you can change the outcome. And I think gaming wise, if you've got a deck of cards, you don't know when that deck of, when that particular card's gonna come or when it's a roll of the dice, it will always randomize the predictable. And so it can feel like it comes down to your generalship, you know, and by advancing five inches, uh, as opposed to nine, that's the turning point in the battle or rolling that six at that moment in time changes the outcome because it disorders that unit they run off the battlefield and you know from that on it's all those sort of moments of randomness and it's a way of disguising the <laughs> the moments of randomness um to make them seem far more in control i suppose well presumably this is where to to you know, total the total war series comes into its own because you can uh get mods for it to to make to to include panic morale endurance and they add a a level of of reality that might otherwise you might not see in a in some form of tabletop. The Total War series still has that you know the helicopter view, and you can go, oh, this heavy cavalry unit that I use to chase off that unit, it's all the way up there, and you know in most ancient battle descriptions you would then read, and they went on to plunder the enemy camp, and we never saw them again until a week later. Um, instead, you can go, aha, you guys can come back now. You can stand right there behind the enemy line, wait a bit, get your, you know, get your breath back and then charge in the rear. And it's kind of like the Homeric version. You know, the sound of thunder in the mountains. Well, that was the voice with which he called back his heavy cavalry <laughs> and he was heard by the commander instantly who turned his horse around and his troop and came back to battle. Exactly, and and the only way to avoid that would be to I don't know which you could do probably is to have a camera fix so that you could only see a couple of units around you and you'd have to switch around all the time, which would be a hell of a lot more difficult. And you could still have more control because you could still switch from the left flank to the unit on the right flank, but you would depend on your mini map to see where is everybody and can I do this and can... But I think actually, you know, the one thing that you would probably as an ancient commander have, you wouldn't actually have the mini-map. In many situations, you wouldn't have an understanding of the terrain ter terribly well, which is, you know, so, so in fact, where these games, I think, and I'm not a gamer, and I'm learning a great deal listening to this conversation, in fact, is the, is the God view is not possible on the ancient battlefield for exactly the reasons you've just said there, Jasper. And in fact, uh, it creates a very false sense of battle. If you don't understand that, you know, that the highest point you're ever going to be is on a hill and you have to hope the hill is 
very high up. But again, to go back to our Fasalis example of a few few editions ago, um, you know, you've got long lines of troops and Caesar's a, a, a point and, and he can maybe look down at, at the start of battle and see nice straight lines. But once they're engaged, it's, whoa, when well, it's down to the people. My, my point earlier is having the game plan. I like yeah. Jasper's game because it would you would have the same situation that we have in ancient battles, which is like you would only have the things that you could see, whether you had the high ground or not. And then you would fight and you would not know what had gone on anywhere else at the battlefield. It'd be like, We've won! Yeah. No, actually you were decimated and destroyed and you're you're now surrounded and getting absolutely smashed. This made me think of um um I think it's a game by Slytherin called Legion. And um there you also you had a top-down view, but the interesting part there was that um, you would deploy your troops at the beginning of the battle, and then the battle would start, and they would go do things. And it was very difficult to stop a unit and make them do something else. Or I think I broke. I think I broke at least one mouse trying to get a unit to charge the flank. You know. No, not there. No. So yes, much <laughs> yelling and screaming. Much like an ancient general would have been done, you know, when they're great. Probably, yes. The opposite thing of what they wanted. Instead of beating a mouse, they would be beating their aide de camp. Well, this is where we run into problems with games because you, 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 you suddenly people don't like that game because people like games where they're in control and where you, some of that control is taken away from you, it becomes not a po as popular a thing. At which well, point and this, it's not and, and I think this goes right to the heart, and I've said this before, is a, what is the point of the exercise you're doing? And if you're simulating, you're doing it presumably for education, and the other one, you're doing it for fun. And I guess part of the idea of fun is you have a really good chance of winning. Otherwise, why would you do it? Yeah, yeah but true. sometimes... It's, it's now, fun, yeah, yeah. I was going I, I to close with this. You, know, you have Time Commanders on, you know, on, on a TV, uh, which is BBC produced, I think, but, but it's, it's popular. And, 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 and that's sold to us as a simulation where you are running as that... And, and it's not. It is still remains as a game, but it's sold as a history simulation, and it, it's not. And it's what, what I really liked, and this is something that we should probably just try to do. We could probably f do that with some, you know, this kind of communication as an experiment. I liked how they had. I think the teams were divided in a in a CNC, and then they had uh, two subalterns. Um, who, who, who in turn had to? So, so the CNC I think could see the whole battle, and then he had to tell his juniors what the units to do on on two flanks, and they had to tell an operator who would actually do it. Mm. Which, which of course confuses the orders because if you don't if you don't give clear orders, um, you know exactly. But that, I thought that was a very very interesting. Um, way of doing things and maybe you know professional military men might be but i think the thing about. there though that the thing i think that flawed it was is that it was it was purely a premise for entertainment so they would take and i don't know if this is true but they'd take a team of sumo wrestlers and and, and bakers and, and the idea was these people don't know an ancient army from adam in fact they probably you know have even, they probably watched 300 and that's their whole idea uh, and then they were given these choices, and of course they would apply the best endeavors as bakers or bikers to. And, and I think if you actually got a team of people who were military people or someone closer to the skill set required, that would be to me much more interesting because they would then be using rational sort of points that they understand to have a material impact on the outcome, rather than oh well, I'm just going to send in my cavalry. Why did you do that? Uh, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea. But then we have, you know, we have rational, competent generals who just send in their cavalry in actual battle scenes. Like, why did you do that? Why didn't you send an infantry support? Ah! So, you know, even those things happen in, in actual battle too, I think, uh, which is funny. Um, I think the other thing about, not just about control, um, is that, because there are some gamers who don't mind not being, you know, who, who don't mind losing a battle. So therefore, I think it is about control and reward. But then a, as a game... As we we're saying before, if it's entertainment, what is the reward? Is it simply hanging out with like-minded people and playing the game? And if that's its own reward, then actually the outcomes don't matter. If you get smashed every single time, you still get to put your soldiers on the table and play a game and roll dice. And that can absolutely be the best time ever. Um, and so, or is your reward only ever winning? In which case you're much more into the 
um, those games where you can know the rules, play the rules, and win every single simulation you ever play. Um, and there are always those people who are looking for more of a challenge. I'm going to set it on hard or hardest or superhuman or whatever um, as a way of trying to get better at the game. Um, I, I think a much more fun way would be the sort of thing that the Emperor Augustus did where he had a Naumachia where he had a, 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 a fleet of ships. One was the Athenians, other was Persians. And of course it was real combat and it was with, with audiences and stands and they could watch the real thing. That would be fun to watch. <laughs> Slightly, slightly bloody, and the insurance bill would be very high. Oh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> right, should we, uh, should we call it a halt? <laughs> Next time we're back, we'll be back looking at the issue of the magazine, and we'll be looking at Victory for Sparta, the finale of the Peloponnesian War. If you want to order your copy of the magazine, you'll be able to pick a copy up from ancient-warfare.com. So I'd like to say thank you to Jasper, Murray, Lindsay, Mark and Mark. Don't forget, if you want to become a patron of the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash ancient warfare podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. and Thanks for listening. <laughs>